أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. We have assembled here to remind ourselves about the important Masail of Hajj. So, as an introduction, we looked into the essence of Hajj, the significance of Hajj, and why we have to undertake this trip based on the verses in the Quran in Surah Ali Imran, ayah number 83 to 85, and then ayah number 96 and 97, which in short said that if God is the master of the universe, he has created it for a purpose, he has a plan for it, and man has been created for the purpose of worshipping, and therefore the first house of worship for true Tawheed was constructed and was designated and that is the Kaaba and therefore the first messenger and all the main messengers till the last messenger all of them came to this house to express their obedience and submission and worship of the true Lord in the form of Hajj and therefore Hajj becomes mandatory on mankind as part of the plan of creation to express their obedience and submission to the absolute master of the universe and we discussed also when is it that it becomes wajib according to this ayah in the Quran in Surah Ali Imran وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنِ اسْتَطَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلَ whosoever has the means then immediately in the year in which those means become available the health, the wealth, the restrictions of the travel are not there therefore this individual has the necessary means to undertake this spiritual journey so if it has become compulsory for this individual in this particular year then he needs to prepare for it so what is required in the preparation we were discussing about this but before I continue I would like to mention one other verse in the Quran about the spiritual dimension of Hajj and that is the ayah which says that we have been called for Hajj not everyone will go to Hajj and there are those amongst us who have heard the call, who have seen the truth, and who have decided to respond, and therefore they are worthy of appreciation and congratulations that they have managed to get the message. And that is the ayah of Surah Hajj, Ayah 27. fil nasi bil Hajj, and proclaim and announce to the people that they should come for Hajj. Ya'atuka, and once you pronounce in response to your call, Ya'atuka, Rijalan, they will come to you. They'll come in by whatever means, even walking by foot. Ya'atuka, Rijalan, wa ala kulli damir, and they will come on every camel, even the lean camel. A lean camel indicating that it is a camel which has come from very far away. Min kulli fajjin amiq from the most distant of the places they will come to you this ayah is interesting because it tells us that the call for Hajj was not only made by the Holy Prophet Sallallahu in the 10th year of Hijrah when he conducted the farewell pilgrimage that's one year before his demise but it also indicates that this call for Hajj before the Holy Prophet was made by the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. So ayah number 25-26 discusses about Ibrahim alayhi salam with Ismail when they constructed the Kaaba. That's when they were given the order to pronounce and proclaim. وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ 
and O Ibrahim, and after you, O Prophet, announce and pronounce to the people. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, according to Riwayah, says that, how can I announce? There are no people here. I've just brought my family. My wife is here. My child is here. Who is there to announce to? So the Riwayah says, God explains that your duty is to announce. My duty is to to enable this announcement to reach to the audience. And therefore, the Riwayah says that that call was made and that that call reached out to everyone. Some responded and said, Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik. And these are the ones who then get the tawfiq to come for, for hajj. وَأَذْذِنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ O Ibrahim, announce to all people, that means even the people of the Abrahamic faith, if they follow the true teachings of Ibrahim السلام, which predicted the Ibrahim who prayed for and who predicted the coming of the last messenger, therefore the true followers of the Abrahamic faith will, will also listen to the call and come for Hajj according to the final call given by the Holy Prophet. And why is it that Ibrahim salam's call is to be delivered to everyone? Ibrahim as the, the father of all the monotheistic religions who single-handedly fought against all shirk. Well, because all of us have been created in such a way that we earnestly seek the true message of Tawheed, the true God and how to worship exclusively this true God in the form of Tawheed. وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ يَأْتُوكَ Don't you worry, Ibrahim. You are all alone, but your voice and your message will be delivered. And in response, people will come. Now, this is a prediction made at the time of Ibrahim salam, And we see now that millions of people are responding to that call. يَأْتُوكَ They will come, definitely. يَأْتُوكَ They will come to your call. They will come to your presence and they will do the Hajj with you. And that's important. We can't go for Hajj and do it by ourselves. We have to follow the example of the Messenger, the Holy Prophet Ibrahim and the last Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ya'atuka. So the essential component of Hajj is the recognition of who is the appointed representative of God through whom God delivers the message. Ibrahim salam announced, but it was the Holy Prophet who then appointed another human announcer at the, in the time of the 10th year of Hijrah. It was the Holy Prophet who then conducted that final pilgrimage which became the role model. And subsequently, in every generation, those who read the Qur'an and those who follow the Sunnah of the Prophet get the message. So the call of Ibrahim is delivered through a chain of transmitters till it comes to our time and we hear the call. We hear the call physically, but do we respond mentally and spiritually? It depends on our state of mind and our state of soul as far as the faith is concerned. So Ibrahim was chosen as the leader and the reason was because he was tested and he passed those tests and therefore he was appointed as the leader for mankind. And then that leader of mankind could now bring mankind to God through Tawheed, through Hajj. وَأَذْذِنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا They will come on foot. وَعَلَى كُلِّ ضامر. And they will come on every lean camel. Lean camel, a camel which is lean, indicating that it's well trained and can move very fast. So they'll come on the swiftest camel. Or no, a lean camel indicating that it has come from a very far and distant place and therefore it has become lean. So they will come as soon as possible and they will come from the furthest corners of the earth. But they will respond to your call, you will see. Interesting that the response has been mentioned in such a way that there will be some coming walking and there will be some coming traveling on a means of transport. 
So walking also is a recommended way of performing Hajj. In fact, some scholars say if God mentions walking before using the means of transport, walking is better to go for Hajj as much as we can. يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا وَعَلَىٰ كُلِّ ضامر. They will come walking or they will come riding. Basically, whatever is their duty, they will perform it and they will respond to the call. So whatever is the means necessary to respond to the call, to come to Masjid Al-Haram and to perform the Wajib Hajj. And it therefore depends on the state of the mind and the heart and conviction and faith. How motivated they are to obey. And one way to raise our faith and to increase our conviction and therefore to respond fully and sincerely to this call and to do all that is possible within our means to respond is to realize as mentioned in Nahjul Balagha in Khutbah number one that the people will come to the Kaaba for the performance of Hajj so eagerly as eagerly as you notice for example the thirsty animals rush to the water hole to quench their thirst all of us also have a type of spiritual thirst which can be quenched by this spiritual journey to the Kaaba. And that spiritual thirst is every human being has been created in such a way that they yearn for justice, they yearn for grace and mercy and love and all the other beautiful divine qualities. We yearn for it, but we don't find it in our societies. Wherever we find it, to a little extent, we're attracted. That person becomes charismatic and magnetic for us. But Allah is the absolute perfect being who has all those beautiful names to the best, unlimited, infinite, perfect degree. And therefore, we will be attracted to visit the house of such a Lord in the process of Hajj. So the call has been made physically by Ibrahim and by the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the hadith, uh, the, the narrator says, I heard this hadith from either the fifth Imam or the sixth Imam Alayhi Wasallam. He doesn't recall because he, he has lived so long with the fifth and the sixth Imam that when he reports, he doesn't recall now, was it the fifth or was it the sixth Imam? He says, Anna Ibrahim adhana fin nasi bil hajj. Ibrahim made his announcement, the physical announcement. But Ibrahim السلام, was chosen to be the Imam. And the Imam is the one who guides people not only physically, not only by being a physical role model, but he also guides their hearts spiritually. So, and the spirit belongs to, to the non-material, timeless world. So the spirit has the capacity to be able to listen to this timeless call which is made by Ibrahim and then the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the announcement was made. Ayyuhan Nas, Inni Ibrahim Khalilullah. I am the chosen and the close friend of God, the beloved of God. I am Ibrahim. To be the beloved of God means you reflect the godly qualities of goodness, of perfection, of kindness, of compassion, of justice, of generosity. So naturally you become uh, an attractive and charismatic person. And people would want to listen to such a call, therefore. Inna Allah amarakum an tahujju hadha al-bayta. Allah has ordered through me to you all mankind to come for hajj of this holy house. فَحُجُّهُ And therefore respond to this call and come for hajj. فَأَجَابَهُ مَنْ يَحُجُّ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ To this call, people till the end of times respond to the timeless call. So, we need to thank Allah that if we have made the decision to go for hajj, in effect, in the spiritual level, somehow we have heard the message and our spirit has responded and decided to say, yes, we've been called and we have 
been accepted to become the guest of God. We've answered that invitation. In order to recognize and realize how important this decision is, compare yourselves to others. There are people who may wish to go for Hajj, but they don't have the means. Either they, maybe they don't have the financial means. Or no, they do have the financial means, but they live in a country which, where the list of the applicants is very long. So for example, in, in the Islamic Republic of Iran, they may have asked for a quota of 100,000 hujjaj. And based on the population of more than 70 or so million, they should be granted 70,000 quota of hujjaj. Yet this year, for example, they only got a quota of 61,000, for example. So not everyone who wants to and has the financial means can go. The path is not open for them. Malaysia is another country. There's a long list. Malaysia is a country where they have a specific uh, policy, the Hajj policy, whereby they, they encourage people to begin to invest and to save early on, such that after some time, over a few years, in their Hajj account, there's enough money to finance their Hajj trip. So there are countries where they have plans financially to go, but the list is too long to accommodate everyone. Some have the means and some want to go and the path is open for them, no travel restrictions, but physically and health-wise they are restricted and disabled. Or incidentally, such people, if they have the financial means and uh, there is the possibility of traveling, if they can't go themselves, then they must appoint somebody else on their behalf through the process of niyabat. You have a scenario where some have the financial means, they are healthy and physically capable, but the government in some countries do not, does not grant them a Hajj visa for a second and a third and a fourth year. It's only once every four or five years. But there is one group of people who know about Hajj and who know, yes, they should be performing it and they're healthy and they're wealthy and there's no restriction, but they're not prepared. Mentally, they have not made that determination and decision as yet. And therefore, congratulations that you have made the right decision, you have heard the call and your spirit has responded. The ayah in the Quran which I quoted of Ibrahim salam announcing, the next ayah says they will respond to the call and they will come for Hajj. Why will they come? What is their benefit? لِيَشْهَدُوا مَنَافِعَ لَهُمْ كُنَا There is a lot of benefit if they come for Hajj. One of course definitely is responding to the call that has been made by the master of the universe who, who governs our bodies and our minds and our spirits. But in the riwayat, we are guided to understand what extra benefits we have in performing hajj other than the simple act of obeying the command of God and submitting to the all-powerful, all-perfect master of the universe. The riwayat says that the reward for coming for hajj the ultimate reward is paradise. And paradise is such a high profit and a prize that it is worth than all the wealth in the world. Because if you have all the wealth in the world, but in Akhirah you end up going to Jahannam, is useless. The Quran in Surah Ma'arid says that on the day of judgment, when the punishment and the fire of hell shall appear, those who deserve to be punished in the fire of hell will wish to be ransomed that they can be protected and saved from the fire of hell and they're ready to pay and give up all the wealth they have. In fact, even double the wealth that they have just to be able to save from the fire of hell. Yet for a small investment and for a small trip of Hajj, we get that protection from the fire of hell and entry into the paradise. And another riwayah says, the, the deceased in the grave, in the barzakh that is, 
they also wish in case if they did not perform the Hajj that they could also get the wealth of the whole of the world just so that they are able to get the reward of Hajj another advantage and benefit and manufa mentioned in the riwayah is that you get protected from poverty and from ill health another effect mentioned is dua will not be rejected another effect mentioned is that hajj and umrah is a means to make a trade whereby you can earn profit uh, it has been compared to a market obviously it's a spiritual market whereby you give in your time and your energy and your effort and your worship and your prayer and your submission and your obedi obedience in return then you get the high profit another device says all your sins will be forgiven and you come back a totally transformed person just like a newborn baby and if a person dies on the trip of lesser pilgrimage, the Umrah, or the bigger pilgrimage, the Hajj, then you get the reward of doing Umrah continuously till the Day of Judgment. Another riwayah says that the minimum reward is that God guarantees that if you live throughout the process, go for Hajj and come back, then you will return safe. But if you die, either going or returning, then you go to Jannah. So, sometimes people may be hesitant if there are some risks involved in traveling. But if the risks are reasonable, we should not fear. The reward is Jannah, God forbid, if it has been decreed that we die on this trip. And finally, the, the Riwayah says, the biggest reward is that you are being invited as a guest of God. As a guest of God, you will be shown hospitality by the host. The host is the master of the universe. And therefore, whatever you ask for and whatever you pray for, your request will be given. In fact, your wealth will be multiplied. Even if you spend one dirham in the way of God, it will be returned a thousand, thousand times. So this spiritual journey with all these benefits both in the dunya and in the akhirah this trip is wajib once in a lifetime and that is a consensual fatwa of all the scholars of the muslim world <coughs> and once we are capable health wise wealth wise and no travel restrictions then it must be done immediately in the ear of capability and not delayed. One of the scholars reminds us that that Hajj basically is to visit the house of God, to go to the presence of God, to get closer to God. It's not to get closer to the dunya. So beware in your decision, your determination, your motivation material profit material benefits should not be the priority dunya should not be your concern it should be to get closer to god so hajj is wajib once in a lifetime it is full of benefits it will transform me totally but i need to be prepared for it and the preparation includes paying off all the wajib debts that we have to God and to other people. And if we have hurt anyone, we win their pleasure and we do the wasiyah. But I would like to focus before everything on the issue of taqlid. Taqlid means that I have to decide to do the hajj according to the guidance of the fatwas of an expert mujtahid. So, it is important to be able to identify and to specify who is the mujtahid whose fatwas I will be following. Kwanini kusababu the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, the Ahlul Bayt alayhi who practiced the sunnah and explained and, 
and clarified the sunnah of the Prophet All of them, they perform this hajj in a specific way. I can't go and do hajj the way I wish. There is a particular procedure uh, to be followed, which is the best way to get close to God and express our obedience to God. And if I make a mistake in the performance of this hajj, then this hajj can become batil. Yes, some mistakes can be excused, but some mistakes cannot be excused. They, they nullify my hajj. I spend all this money, all this time, and then I discover once I come back that I made some major mistake. I wish I knew, but I didn't know. Ignorance is no excuse. Some mistakes are excusable, but that also, who decides which mistake in performance of hajj is excusable and not excusable? Again, it is the mushtahid's fatwa based on the riwayat of the Ahlul Bayt salam. So for example, in the Mina rituals, the uh, stoning of the shaitan in Jamaratul Aqaba or the slaughtering or the trimming and shaving on the day of Eid. If somebody mixes up the sequence, then according to some fatwas, you can be excused. But there are some other errors you may make whereby they are not excusable. In fact, the fatwa of the mushtay to say is not excusable is based on the riwayat of the Ahlul Bayt salam, where they tell the person, the hajji who made that mistake, go and repeat your hajj. So for example, a person crosses the miqat and doesn't do the ihram properly. Or no, he does the tawaf but without the proper tahara. He doesn't know the proper rulings about the tahara. Or God forbid the tahara breaks in between the tawaf and he didn't know what to do and therefore the tawaf is nullified. Tawaf is one of the wajib rukn of hajj. Rukn means that even by mistake you do it wrongly, not accepted, not excusable. Just like ruku' in the salah, it's a wajib rukn. So we definitely need to be guided by the expert opinions of the mujtahids. I will skip some details, maybe I'll come back to it later on. So we need to quickly remind ourselves about the definition of taqlid and why we do taqlid and how should we do it and whom should we follow. So taqlid basically is defined as the decision to follow a particular expert known as the mujtahid. Why should we follow him? Remember that ayah in the Quran said, Ibrahim alayhi salam, you announce. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa you announce. The teachings then spread to the Ahlul Bayt and they reached us. So the announcement has been made. In response, the ayah says, Ya'tuka rijalan. They will come to you, you Ibrahim, you the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa That means they will have to come and do the hajj in your presence, with your guidance, with your leadership, under your leadership. So we need that guidance and that guidance is in the form of following the fatwa of the mujtahid. In the usul al deen we say no, we follow the usul al deen by our own logic and understanding. But in the furu al deen we need to follow the expert opinion of the mujtahid. So taqlid is that decision to follow a particular mujtahid's opinions. There are qualities that you should look for in a mujtahid which qualify him to be competent expert. And uh, in some cases, it becomes necessary if there are several mujtahids to decide to follow the one who is the best, who is technically, technically known as the a'lam mujtahid, the most learned. So, the situation where one knows that there are several mujtahids who are qualified, but there is a difference of opinion amongst them. In the situation of difference of opinion, my duty therefore is to not choose whomsoever I want. I must choose the one amongst them who is the most learned. So for example, in the case of Hajj, there's a difference of opinion whether if a person is indebted and he has taken a loan and he has to pay it back to the lender, does this prevent him from, from going for Hajj or not? There's a difference of opinion 
Some say yes, he can go for Hajj if it is to be paid in installments and the next installment has to be paid after he returns from Hajj. No problem, he can go for Hajj. Other Mushtari say no, if it's an outstanding debt, even if the installment has to be paid after Hajj, you cannot go for Hajj. So there is a difference of opinion. When you go to Masjid Shajara after Medina to enter into uh, Ihram, Masjid Shajara is the Miqat, there's a difference of opinion. Where in Masjid Shajara you're allowed to enter into Ihram? Is it the whole locality, the neighborhood of Masjid Shajara? Or no, the Masjid itself is the place of Ihram. Or no, once you're in the Ihram, there are certain prohibitions which you are to avoid in the state of Ihram. There's a difference of opinion. Should you take the nightshade for males or not? Should the women cover their face or not? There's a difference of opinion. Whenever there are differences, Definitely now we have to choose one who is the most learned to assure us that <coughs> we don't make, we make the least errors. None of them are ma'asum. It's just that the mushtahis fatwa is the best way to ensure that we have reached the truth as much as is possible for human beings. So the definition of the most learned, simple. He is the one who is more capable than others in deriving, in understanding and in deriving the divine laws from its uh, legal sources, the Qur'an, the Hadith. A second issue that you need to know about the mujtahid is that if in case you started doing taqlid early on in life and by now when you're going for hajj, that first mujtahid whose taqlid you did has passed away. Now you're referring to another living mujtahid. The living mujtahid says that if the experts consider the deceased still to be more learned than the living, then in all the old masail, you must follow the deceased. In the new masail, no, you refer to the living. So again, if you are facing a scenario where you have started to plead with a, a mushtahid who is now deceased, you may have to follow the deceased. Unless you say, no, the experts that I have asked for guidance, they are telling me, no, that now the living, the most learned amongst the living, is not only more learned than all the living mushtahids, but he has also become more learned than the deceased who I had started to do taqlid of. No problem. Then you make a total ruju to the living. So in case you have discovered through consultation with the experts that no, compared to the most learned of the living, that that deceased is still more learned than the most learned of the living. So you need to continue to follow. You will follow the masail of the deceased. Which ones? Will you follow the ones you already know? Or the ones you know and have not forgotten? Or the ones that you know and have not forgotten and did act upon? Or no, there are some masail that you don't know at all. Because it, the situation never arose for you in, your, in, in his lifetime. He is deceased now. Now you have decided to go for Hajj. Therefore all the masail are going to be new for you. But the fatwa of the living mujtahid is that no, it is valid to follow the deceased in all the masail, even if you didn't know during the lifetime of the deceased, even if you knew and forgot those masail now that you want to go for Hajj, even if you knew and you did not forget, but you never got the chance to act upon it, still that fatwa is the fatwa of the more learned. That's the criteria. And if there are one or two or three who have become deceased, because we are an elderly person now, then amongst the deceased, whoever is considered to be the most learned or the more learned amongst them. How do I get to know who is the most learned? Well, they are second ranking mujtahids who will tell us who are the top ranking mujtahids. I will be conducting the masail based on the fatwas of Marhuma Atullah Khoi Rahmatullah Alayhi 
and Hazrat Ahlul Sistani, Hafizahullah. But if anyone amongst you is in the taqlid of any other mujtahid, you'll have to inform me then from the next session onwards, I will prepare the extra opinions in case there's any difference in, in, in that other mujtahid. Before I end, one reminder. Some of the problems we were facing with Hujjaj in the past years was because they found some masail difficult to follow, they suddenly decide to switch the taqlid. So for example, there's a difference of opinion between the mujtahids and they say, oh well, rather than the parents doing taqlid of one mujtahid and the children doing taqlid of another mujtahid, in order to unify the family, we've decided all of us to make the taqlid of the same mujtahid. That is not the reason. The unity of the family should not be the excuse. The basis should be follow the most learned according to the experts. So if the children are born at a time when the parents' mujtahid has already passed away, the children will start with the living. The parents will continue with the deceased if the deceased has been determined to be more learned. Oh, you know, it's easier to practice the fatwa of some mujtahids because Ahli Kitab, for example, is considered by them not to be najis. No, that is not the criteria. The criteria is who's more learned. Uh, I, the fatwas are a bit difficult to follow. The youths, for example, may wish to get married to a, a woman whose consent the father, biological father, is refusing to give. There are some mujtahids who say, no, you can bypass the refusal of the father. Very good mushtai to follow for the youths, for example. Um, yes, I know there are several mushtais, but the one you are introducing me to is difficult to access. Yeah, but you don't need to access physically. His fatwas are there online in printed form, in digital format, no problem. Um, I don't have the printed fatwas. Well, there are other options available. Yes, but you're telling me to follow this mushtad. I've been hearing things about this particular marja. I heard these representatives are corrupt people. Yeah, the agents may be corrupt, but the marja himself is, is just and qualified and competent. So, the fatwas will be based on these two grand ayatollahs. But if you wish to know anybody else's fatwas, you'll have to intimate to me, inshaAllah. Let's pray to Allah for tawfiq that we get the strength to be able to prepare for this spiritual journey in such a way that we can bring about this transformation in our lives such that we come back totally pure and purified just like newborn babies, inshaAllah. We'll come back reborn. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل
قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد Tapita kidogo katika talbia Labbaik Allahumma labbaik Labbaik la sharika laka labbaik Inna alhamda Wa al-ni'mata Laka wa al-mulk لا شريك لك لبيك إن شاء الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وفيه نستعين ونستغفره ونتوب إليه نصلي ونسلم إلى حبيبنا وشفيعنا أبي القاسم محمد كنا بعض يا كلمات تتكوى تنا تموك بمودة kama nilianza jana tulianza kama sijui wengine walikuwa wameshaandika ile pronoun za muhimu sana mtu anaweza kutamka ana ikiwa dada naye anasema ana sasa ukimwesharia mwenzako utasema anta ya ali anti ya Fatima Sawa Asa wakiwa wawili jana nilisema Ima Fatima Masalan Fatima na Zainab Antuma Antuma ya Fatima wa ya Zainab Antuma Tazahabani masalan au taruhani na maskini utasema yaani ya hasan antuma hakuna difference sasa plural kwa wanawake mtasema antunna usikosee hapa antunna nisa utamuke vizuri antunna hai kwa muzakkar utasema antum hii imekuja sana kwenye Qur'an antum au kuntum antum Aya. sasa second person third person kwa mwanamke unamwambia mnavyosema english ni she eh? sasa arabi utasema here utauliza aina hia aina hia yuko wapi aina hia mko safarini mwenzenu amepotea mtaulizana aina ukhti fatima aina hia ima ali naye ta amepotea utasema aina huwa tawlizane ho aina huwa aina dhahaba aina raha sasa wakiwa wengi kama hawapo tasema hunna kwa english hakuna hunna dhahabna wao wanawake wengi wamekwenda hunna dhahabna 
tukiweka kwenye present hunna yadhhabna hunna yadhhabna wao wanawake wengi wanakwenda au yarohna yadhhabna ilal madinati yadhhabna ilal madinati hunna wa mudhakkar mtasema hum yadhhabuna hum yaruhuna hum yajlisuna hum yarauna bas ha idhni pronounced na repeat ana mudhakkar na muanas anta anti antuma antuma antum wa antunna hiya kama vile dada ameingia tutasema hiya dakhalat hiya dakhalat ye dada ameingia mfano kaka yule ameingia huwa dakhala huwa yadkhulu present tense huwa yadkhulu ye anaingia sasa wakiwa wengi tutasema hum yadkhuluna hum yadhhabuna hum yaakuluna inshallah pole pole sasa e kwa kutoa sasa maamkizi salamu alaykum salamu alaykum au salamu alaykum wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh kaifa halu ka kimuuliza mwenzio kaifa halu ka anta usimuulize dada kaifa halu ka la dada anamuuliza mwenzio kaifa halu ki anti sawa kaifa halu ki hasa answer jawabu itakuwa ni mmoja ana bi khairi na yeye anasema ana bi khairi wen taruh kwa sababu wa saudi wana kiarabu chao kisichokuwa cha vitabu cha grama tukiingia kwenye arabic ya grama anta aina tazhabu anta aina tazhabu anti aina tazhabina na ba anti aina tazhabina wewe dada unaenda wapi aina tazhabina lakini kule Saudia utasikia aina taruhina usiona ajabu eh? aina taruhina kwa sababu atakwambia roh atakwambia <laughs> roh maana anti au anta roh nenda wen taruh unenda wapi wanakuuliza wewe anta wen taruh yani aina taruh badala wen shunonek wanakuambia mfano shunonek lakini sio kiarabu cha grama ni kaifa halu ka sa hasa jawabu ana adhhabu ila suqi dada tasema ana adhhabu ila suqi naenda sokoni supermarkets supermarket ni nini suqu sasa ukisema adhhabu ila suqi sawa ukisema ila suqu basi watakuelewa ukisema ila suqa watakuelewa <laughs> na wewe utajibu ana adhhabu ila suqi amgo when la supermarket sasa au naenda haram hivi adhhabu ila alharam 
kwa kina mama eh? huenda unapotea <laughs> kula kina mama ah ifate huenda mezuba haukuoni utasema ana min tanzania i'm from tanzania ana min tanzania na baba naye anaweza kusema ana min tanzania nimetoka tanzania aina tazhabu aina taruh unaenda wapi utadibu azhabu au aruh ila funduk 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 ni nini guest house funduk funduk aruh ila funduk na kwenda hotel kupumzika narud aruhu ila alharam sasa ndio inajulikana sana baba aruh ila dukani ukitamka dukani tayari we ni mswahili dukani kiarabu na kiswahili ni dukani aruh ila dukani sasa umefika dukani ma hadha hiki ni nini ma hadha unauliza hiki ni nini au unauliza bei become hadha shortcut ya become hadha muuza dukani unamuuliza unaoonesha kidole kwa sababu kiarabu bado unaoonesha kidole ya akhi ya akhi ya akhi ewe ndugu <laughs> ndugu eh? ya akhi ya akhi become hadha atakuelewa huenda tasema 100 riali <laughs> lakini wengi wanawajibu kwa english <laughs> atakwambia kwa english lakini tayari umesha mudibu ukisema punguza khafif tumwambia khafif li khafif li hai ukitaka mwambia niuzie sasa mimi ba li ba li afadhali soko ya saudia wanawake hawapo hawauze ni wanaume tu ndio maana unamwambia mwanaume anta ba li wewe uniuzie mimi wangekuwa wanawake wanauza tungesema anti bi'i <laughs> li lakini wanawake saudia hawajishirikishi na masuala business unasema tu anta ya akhi bi'i li qamiswa bi'i li uh, qur'ana bi'i li masuala ya chakula tutaona huko inshallah kwa hiyo haya ni machache inshallah na repeat mara mwisho ana anta anti antuma antuma antum antunna huwa hi eh kwa english eh sasa hiya she huma bas haitumike sana eh huma wao wawili alafu hum na hunna inshallah tutakuwa tunakumbushana tutaelimishana taratibu muda wenyewe tuliopewa ni mchache sana inshallah wa ila kuna nakta fi walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin